We are tracking H1N1 and health officials here in the U.S. saying it's too soon to know if a one-shot vaccine for the virus will actually be effective. The U.S. is working on an inoculation that requires two doses, although China and Switzerland recently announced they may have a one-dose version. We're told American officials will release their initial results from its vaccination studies and testing later this month. With me now, Dr. Kent Holtorf, who is an expert on infectious diseases. Doctor, thanks very much. We're going to put up on the screen the classic H1N1 symptoms, and I got this uh, from the WHO and the CDC. If anybody exhibits these symptoms, what should they do? Should they go to the hospital? Should they see their doctor? What? Well, the nice thing is it's showing that the H1N1 virus is losing its virulence. So we saw this as it came through Mexico. It lost its, uh, its virulence in that the symptoms were much more mild. And that's what seems to be happening as it's making its way back through as a seasonal flu. So basically, the, the uh, recommendations are the same as the seasonal flu. If you have uh, continual uh, fever for more than three hours, call your physician. Uh, if you have recurrence of fever after it goes away, if you have a high risk, including small children, um, consider calling your physician. Yeah. Uh, if you do have, let's say, a kid turns blue, has blue fingernails, go to the emergency room. But the, it's really, there's no difference between who to take to the emergency room or to the doctor versus a seasonal versus a swine flu. In fact, if you had to choose, you'd probably choose at this point the swine flu over the regular seasonal flu. Is that right? All right, now what do you think of the vaccination? You know, that's the, I have more concern about the vaccine than I do about the swine flu. It's been rushed to market. There are high levels of uh, adjuncts, which um, basically make it more potent, make so they can, uh, they, it's kind of an unrefined method that they use. They had to use these high levels of these adjuncts, including thimerosal. It's, a, it's an antiseptic uh, preservative. And hasn't that been linked in some cases to um, autism? It, it has, and you look, it's been shown to, to cause autism in children with mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, and other uh, is controversial, though highly implicated. And the problem is you don't know if your child has mitochondrial dysfunction. I also worry about children and people who have blood-brain barrier dysfunction or it's not fully uh, developed, which include children, pregnant women, chronic neurological illnesses, and chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Right. I've seen these people have been devastated by these infections. Right, would you these, give it to your kids? I definitely would not. You would not. All right. And in fairness, I've talked to three doctors in three days now, and all three have said absolutely they would give it to their kids. They intend to give it to their kids. They're going to take it themselves, but you say no. I, I definitely would not. I've seen it devastate people with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, highly implicated, again, in, in autism. Um, I think you're rolling the dice. Uh, it's a proven neurotoxin. It has 25,000 times the level of mercury than would be considered toxic if it was a food or a water. Right. And levels get up, serum levels, up to 100 times the toxic level. I, it, it just, it's too big of a risk. All right. Dr. Kent Holtorf, um, uh, an expert on infectious diseases. Uh, that's the other side. We've heard uh, both sides now. Thank you so much.